on World News Tonight. Chaos in the capital. U.S. election for Speaker going into multiple rounds after a group of hard right Republicans denied McCarthy the votes he needed. Transparency calls. WHO warns China against trying to hide the actual facts of the severity of COVID. Record permits. Canada tackles a bottleneck on the labour market by hitting a record number of permanent residency permits granted in 2022. And light in the darkness. Young Ukrainian acrobats performed alongside international competitors despite their hardships. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight and we bring you news from around the globe. And we are leading tonight with the epic battle in the United States, starting off the new Congress vote where top Republican Kevin McCarthy is still struggling to get enough votes to become Speaker. This was described as a chaotic kickoff for the GOP as they took back control of the House. It's not the kind of history Republicans were hoping to make. Tonight, for the first time in 100 years, failing to elect a Speaker of the House. A Speaker has not been elected. On Jeff ballot? A Speaker has not been elected. After ballot? A Speaker has not been elected. The chaos, the result of a bitter battle between Republicans, a small but stubborn faction of right-wing members voting against party leader Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy projecting confidence this morning. I'm not going anywhere. I will always fight to put the American people first, not a few individuals that want something for themselves. But also predicting a drawn-out process. McCarthy, is there any scenario in which you drop out of this race? No. McCarthy had already made major concessions to the rebel Republicans who were pushing him for prime committee seats, commitments to vote on specific legislation and rules changes, including some that would make it easier to oust a speaker later. With the House constitutionally bound to elect a speaker before taking up any other business, rank and file Republicans, the vast majority of whom back McCarthy, growing frustrated by the small group of holdouts. For much of the day, top Democrat Hakeem Jeffries actually had more votes for speaker than McCarthy. But Republicans hold the narrow House majority and the only real path to electing a speaker, if they can agree on who. India aims to cut spending on food and fertilizer subsidies to 3.7 trillion rupees, which is $44.6 billion in the fiscal year from April, down 26% from this year. Two government officials said to rein in the fiscal deficit that ballooning during the COVID-19 pandemic. To get more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Gayatri Gunasekar, joining us now from Delhi in India. Gayatri, over to you. Yes, Shenali, food and fertilizer subsidies alone account for about one-eighth of India's total budget spending of 39.45 trillion rupees this fiscal year, but reductions in food subsidies in particular may prove politically sensitive with elections looming on the horizon. The government expects to budget around 2.3 trillion rupees for food subsidies in the coming fiscal year compared with 2.7 trillion rupees for the current year to March 31st. The finance ministry declined to comment while the food and fertilizer ministries did not immediately reply to the request for comment. A large part of the savings will come from the end of COVID-19 era free food scheme which will be replaced with a low spending program that will effectively have the free ration available to the poor in a year with a series of state elections while general elections loom in 2024. The reduction in fertilizer subsidies is also driven by expectation of lower crude oil prices and the government's revised gas procurement policy for fertilizer companies with, uh, with which came into the effect earlier this month. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhida a World News Special Correspondent Gayathri Gunasekar reporting from Delhi in India. Pakistan's government has ordered all malls and markets to close by 8.30 p.m., among other measures in the new energy conservation plan as the country grapples with an economic crisis. Pakistan foreign exchange reserves barely cover a month of worth of imports, most of which are accounted for by energy purchases from abroad, with funds expected under an international monetary fund program having been delayed. 
Pakistan's Minister of Defence Kawaja Asif told journalists the cabinet approved measures to shut markets, including restaurants, aimed to save the cash-strapped country about 62 billion Pakistani rupees. He said additional immediate measures included shutting wedding halls by 10 p.m. daily. He added that some market representatives had pushed for longer hours, but the government decided that earlier closure was needed. However, traders refused compliance, saying their businesses would be ruined, and the shops were open in the capital in Islamabad till 10.30 p.m. In Lahore, the capital of Punjab province and Karachi, the capital of Sindh province, the markets were open till late night. Asif also said Prime Minister Shebaz Sharif had ordered all government departments to reduce electricity consumption by 30 percent. The move comes as Pakistan struggles to quell default fears in domestic and international markets with a $1.1 billion IMF bailout tranche stuck due to differences over the ninth program review, which should have been completed in November. Other critical multilateral and bilateral financing avenues are also linked to the IMF program, which means the South Asian nation of 220 million people is hard-pressed to meet external financing needs of over $30 billion up until June 2023, including debt repayments and energy imports. Pakistan's total liquid foreign exchange reserves stood at $11.7 billion, $5.8 billion with the central bank as of late last month, having fallen 50% in 2022. Asif said the energy conservation plan also included banning the production of energy-inefficient bulbs and fans from February and July, respectively. He added Pakistan's peak summer electricity usage was 29,000 megawatts, compared with 12,000 megawatts in the winter, mainly due to the use of fans in hotter months. Half of the streetlights across the country will remain switched off as a symbolic gesture, the minister said. Most of Pakistan's electricity is produced using imported fossil fuels, including liquefied natural gas, prices of which have skyrocketed over recent months. The government has tried to stabilize the economy by containing imports and decades-high inflation. A fast depreciating currency has made imports more expensive, while consumer prices saw a 25% year-on-year rise in the first half of the current fiscal year. The World Health Organization urged Beijing to share detailed data on the virus since the Chinese state media played down the severity of the surge of COVID infections in the country. The WHO also said that they wanted a more realistic picture about the COVID-19 situation. Meanwhile, the Chinese government says COVID-19 testing requirements imposed on passengers from China are unacceptable and threatened countermeasures against countries involved. China played down the severity of a surge of COVID-19 infections as the World Health Organization urged the country to regularly share specific and real-time information on the outbreak. Leading scientists advising the WHO said they wanted a more realistic picture about the COVID-19 situation from China's top experts who are invited to a virtual close meeting with its technical advisory group on Tuesday to present data on which variants are circulating in the country. It is not open to the public or media. China's abrupt U-turn on COVID controls on December the 7th, as well as the accuracy of its case and mortality data, have come under increasing scrutiny at home and abroad. Some countries, including the United States and France, will require COVID tests on travellers from China. China's foreign ministry spokesperson Mao Ning labelled these travel entry curbs as simply unreasonable, saying that they lack scientific basis. We are firmly opposed to attempts to manipulate the epidemic prevention and control measures for political purposes. On Tuesday, the People's Daily, the Communist Party's official newspaper, cited Chinese experts as saying the illness caused by the virus was relatively mild for most people. But as the virus spreads unchecked, funeral parlors have reported a spike in demand for their services. China reported three new COVID deaths for Monday, taking its official death toll since the pandemic began to 5,253. International health experts predict there will be at least one million deaths in China this year. Hospitals are also packed with patients. This emergencies area in a Shanghai hospital was filled on Tuesday, with long queues of patients waiting to be seen. As Chinese workers and shoppers fall ill, concerns mount about the near-term growth prospects in the world's second-largest economy.
Expectations for the tourism industry are high for China's biggest holiday, the Lunar New Year, which begins on January 21st this year. Some experts predict infections will have peaked in many places. South Korea's Yoon warns of ending military pact. Yoon made the comment after being briefed on countermeasures to North Korean drones that crossed into the South last week. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol said on Wednesday he would consider suspending a 2018 inter-Korean military pact if the North violates its airspace again, his office said amid tension over a recent intrusion by North Korean drones. Yoon made the comment after being briefed on countermeasures to North Korean drones that crossed into the South last week, calling for building an overwhelming response capability that goes beyond proportional levels, according to his press secretary Kim Yun hee The 2018 deal sealed on the sidelines of a summit between North Korea and leader Kim Jong-un and South Korean President Moon Jae-in calls for seizing all hostile acts, creating a no-fly zone around the border and removing landmines and guard posts with the heavily fortified demilitarized zone. The government has not said how many mines and posts were removed, citing security concerns. Abandoning the pact could mean the return of the guard posts, live fire drills in the former no-fly zone, all of which drew angry responses from Pyongyang before the pact. Inter-Korean relations have been testy for decades but have grown even more tense since Yoon took office in May, pledging a tougher line against Pyongyang. During the election campaign last year, Yoon said Pyongyang had repeatedly breached the agreement with missile launches and warned he might scrap it. He said after taking office that the pact's fate hinges on the North's actions. Yoon has criticized the military's handling of the drone incident, in part blaming the previous administration's reliance on the 2018 pact. He has urged the military to stand ready to retaliate even if that means risking escalation. Yoon ordered the defense minister to launch a comprehensive drone unit that performs multipurpose missions, including surveillance, reconnaissance and electronic warfare, and to set up a system to mass-produce small drones that are difficult to detect within the year. South Korea's army operated two drone squadrons within its ground operations command since 2018, but they were primarily designed to prepare for future warfare. The defense ministry has said it plans to launch another unit focusing on surveillance and reconnaissance functions, especially targeting smaller drones. To boost its anti-drone capability, the ministry announced plans last week it would spend 560 billion won over the next five years on technology such as airborne laser weapons and signal jammers. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Stay with us. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, it was a mournful day in Brazil as the soccer's King Pele was laid to rest. Thousands attended the funeral procession that carried his coffin through the streets of Santos. An outpouring of emotion in the Brazilian town of Santos as the body of the football legend Pele makes its final journey. After a 24-hour wake at the Santos FC Stadium, where he played most of his football, a fire truck transported him through the town. The funeral procession of O'Reilly, the king, made a stop at his mother's house, who was 100 years old, and, at least in the first few days, was not aware of her son's death. Among those to pay their respects was Brazil's new president, Lula, who was seen comforting Pele's wife, Marcia Aoki. Pele passed away last Thursday at the age of 82 after battling colon cancer since 2001. An estimated 230,000 people came to the Villa Belmiro Stadium to say one final goodbye. After a private ceremony with family, the man held to be the world's greatest footballer will be laid to rest on the ninth floor of the vertical cemetery of Santos and a clear view of the stadium in sight. Record flooding triggered by heavy rainfall inundated wildlife and homes in Kimberley region of Western Australia as local authorities declared an emergency in the area. Fitzroy Crossing residents are worried they could run out of food and fuel as a once-in-a-century flood isolates the remote town in Western Australia's Kimberley region. Homes and businesses were inundated by floodwaters, with some residents airlifted by helicopter to Broome 350 kilometres away. The Great Northern Highway was cut in both directions. The Fitzroy River reached 15.09 metres, its highest level on record on Wednesday morning, and was still rising. With the peak expected to hit on Wednesday evening, Residents feared they could be cut off for another week. 
The Federal Emergency Management Minister Murray Watt said on Wednesday that the Albanese government had approved a state request for Defence Force aircraft and personnel to help evacuate residents from Fitzroy Crossing and nearby areas. Three people were airlifted off the Shanley River Artesian Range Wilderness Camp after power and water systems failed. Four others were airlifted from the Morrington Wilderness Camp on Wednesday, but four further people remained after floodwaters swamped the most of the buildings at the site. It was hoped those still stuck could be rescued later in the day, but that would depend on the weather generated by the extropical cyclone Ellie. The rain is coming from extropical cyclone Ellie, which dumped between 200 millimeters and 600 millimeters since Saturday and was predicted to deliver further widespread heavy falls. The weather system has been moving slowly towards the coast and was located immediately east of Broome on Wednesday morning, lashing the region with strong winds and intense downpours. Now over to the Russia and Ukraine conflict. Ukraine says it carried out an attack in the occupied region of Donetsk, claiming to have killed 400 Russian soldiers in the process. Russia denies the number of casualties was so high as the Kremlin continued attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure. Ukrainian forces on Sunday fired rockets at a facility in the eastern Donetsk region where Russian soldiers were stationed, claiming to have killed 400 Russian troops with 300 others injured in the process. However, the claim was rebutted by Russia's defense ministry, which says only 63 Russian soldiers were killed. Neither figures have been independently confirmed. Nevertheless, regardless of the actual figure, the attack marks one of the deadliest against Kremlin forces since the war began more than 10 months ago, not to mention the highest number of deaths acknowledged by Moscow in a single incident. According to Russia's defense ministry, Ukrainian forces fired six rockets using the U.S.-made HIMARS rocket system at a building housing Russian troops. Meanwhile, Russia continued its offensives, having deployed multiple exploding drones in another nighttime attack on Ukraine. Ukrainian officials say Moscow is continuing its strategy of using bombardments to target the country's energy infrastructure and wear down Ukrainian resistance to its invasion. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky on Monday also echoed those remarks. We have information that Russia is planning a protracted attack using Shahid drones. It is probably banking on exhaustion, exhausting our people, our anti-aircraft defenses our energy, but we act and do everything so that the terrorists fall in their aim, as all their others have failed. The Shahed drone refers to Iranian-made drones that Russia has been using in its offensives. However, Iran has previously denied that it had supplied Russia with military weapons. Canada set an immigration record last year by granting more than 437,000 foreigners permanent residency. The Canadian government said as it ramps up immigration to fight a tight labour market. The government had set a target to welcome 431,645 new permanent residents in 2022, and the Immigration Ministry said Canada has reached that target to make it the largest annual intake of people in Canadian history. The tally for last year is about 9% higher than 2021, when Canada surpassed the previous record set in 1913, and comes as Canada seeks to bring in 1.45 million new permanent residents by 2025 end. Immigration is a key part of the solution as Canada focuses on addressing an acute labour market shortage, the ministry said. People with permanent residency permits can typically apply for citizenships after five years. Immigration accounts for almost 100% of Canada's labour force growth and by 2036, immigrants will represent up to 30% of Canada's population, up from 20.7% in 2011, the statement said. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government has relied on immigration to boost the Canadian economy and support an ageing population since coming to power in 2015. Shortage of skilled workers in industries like healthcare is acute, and the most recent official data shows there were 871,300 job vacancies in October, down from a record high in over a million open roles in Canada in May. To tackle that, Ottawa is planning targeted draws for skilled immigrants for the first time in 2023, allowing it to cherry-pick applicants with the most in-demand skills for the regions of the country that most need workers. But many immigrants still 
struggle to find work in their chosen field, and some advocates say supports have not grown in pace with the number of new permanent residents. The ministry said that Canada has also struggled to keep up with the surge in applications after COVID-19 pandemic-related restrictions eased as a number of process applications doubled to about 5.2 million in 2022 from the previous year. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Myanmar troops and weaponry have paraded through the capital to mark 75 years of independence from Britain. Just days after the country's military rulers sent the democratically elected leader and Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi to prison for a combined 33 years. Cristiano Ronaldo has been officially unveiled as the new player for Saudi Arabian football club Al Nasser. Ronaldo's official presentation took place amongst the cheers of thousands of fans and fireworks on Tuesday at Al Nasser's Masood Park Stadium in the Saudi Arabian capital of Riyadh. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration is allowing retail pharmacies to offer abortion pills in the United States for the first time. The agency said as most states seek to ban medication abortion. Mexican authorities said that they have fired the director of the prison near the U.S. border where at least 30 inmates escaped at the weekend after a deadly riot, as police began a manhunt for missing convicts. Bank and Freed is accused of looting billions of dollars in FTX customer deposits to support his Armada Research Hedge Fund, buy real estate and make millions of dollars in political contributions in what prosecutors have called a fraud of epic proportions. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now we are leaving you tonight with young Ukrainian acrobats dazzling crowds with their performances in Budapest, for which they practice in their unheated bomb shelters. Stay safe and have a good night.